Good evening, those who are inside this auditorium, as well as those who are watching via the different social media platforms available to us. I hope that wherever you are, the good Lord is leading you. Tonight, once again, I would like to appreciate the beautiful singing from the choir, uh, wherever it came from, I pray that God will continue to bless it. Um, and then, of course, music uh, played on the piano by, again, a young person. This is incredible. And this is as it should be. And I see that the major players in the drama, the spiritual drama, are all young people including your pastors and, uh, you know, your elders, all young people. This is incredible, and I praise God. Tonight, I would like to speak on the subject, the greatest question ever asked and the greatest answer ever given. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 16. And just before we read the particular um, text, let me just give a background to the text that we will read tonight. The setting of this particular presentation is the town or city of Philippi in the province of Macedonia. God had directed Silas and Paul to move to that particular city in order to play an important role. There were God's people who needed to hear the message of salvation. When they got there, unfortunately, they did something which displeased some people, and as a result, they were thrown into prison. And while in prison, at midnight, the Bible says that Silas and uh, Paul were singing songs of praise to God. And let's pick it from there. Acts chapter 16, verses 31, and going all the way down. Or maybe let's begin at, from 25, where it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm. For we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be saved, you and your household. This interesting question. First of all, I want you to notice something. Something that we even spoke about yesterday. The personal nature in which this particular question has been asked by the prison jailer. 
He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not another person. I, the one who is speaking to you, what must I do in order to be saved? For indeed, we look at this particular question and we see its personness. In the judgment, when we walk before God, we do not go in groups, but we walk one by one before Jehovah's awful throne. And it's important that for all of us, as we listen to this message tonight, we ask ourselves this important question, a personal question. What must I do to be saved? Unfortunately, for the majority of God's people, including those who worship in this house of the Lord, and notice I say, for the majority of God's people, this is a question many people have not really settled. It's so common for people to simply think, well, because we go to church and this has become a tradition, Therefore, this important question of how one is saved has been settled. I read a story recently where one man was asked the question, what do you believe in? His response was, I, I believe in what my church believes. He was asked, so what does your church believe in? Well, my church believes in what I believe. So, what do you both believe in? Well, both my church and I believe in one and the same thing. This question, my dear friends, is the mother of all questions. It is the greatest question that has ever been asked. In the words of Christ in the book of Mark chapter, chapter 8, and I want to turn your attention there because this is important. Mark, in the book of Mark chapter, uh, chapter 8, listen to how Jesus puts this whole matter before us. Now, Jesus is talking about the important question of life as we know it. And it's big questions. For you know, many people, as they walk through life's experiences, have a tendency to think of all these things that are not truly as important as this thing that we call salvation. So Jesus makes a statement, he asks a question when he says, what shall each profit a man if he were to lose eternal life, uh, if he were to gain the whole world and lose eternal life? Its basis, the basis of this particular question, this question is connected to life, the important issues of life, because many times, many of us, have our minds fixed to things that are not really important. And Jesus must bring this whole question to us tonight because many of us are running after so many things that are not critical. It is this question of how we are saved that made Jesus Christ come all the way from heaven to come to this dark earth in order to answer this particular question, how we are saved. And I want you to notice something. When Jesus came here, even though there were important questions of mathematics, important questions of, 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 of science, important questions of physics, important questions of chemistry, those were never the questions he I focused his attention on because he understood that the critical question in this life has to do with how a man is saved. This, my dear friends, 
is the great question of all times. How are we saved? How am I saved? I want you to notice the critical answer, which to us becomes the greatest answer ever given to mortal men. Again, Acts chapter 16. Notice how uh, Silas and Paul puts Silas and Paul put the whole uh, uh, question, uh, the, the, the answer to the whole question. In 31, uh, the answer is given. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the answer of all answers. You know, I was thinking the other day about the, the theoretical physicist, Albert Einstein and, and, and his theory of relativity and, 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 you know, how it has impacted science and to the extent that Einstein has become the greatest scientist that ever lived. You know, when I have tried to look at that particular theory of Einstein, to try to grasp it, to understand it, uh, even the people who have tried to explain it, I have never gotten the meaning, its meaning. Indeed, there are so many things I do not understand in physics, in, 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 in mathematics, and, and, and even chemistry. The other day, as I was uh, flying from Lusaka to uh, Nairobi, I kept asking myself a question. Now, you know, the law that allows this heavy bird we call the plane to overcome the force of gravity, to surge upward, and not only to go upward, but to be able to move through the air without coming down. I don't understand this particular law. But, you know, I really don't even care that I do not understand Einstein's theory of, of relativity. I don't care that I do not understand many of the, 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 the laws in physics because they are not as important as this statement that is given by the Apostle Paul and Silas when they respond to the jailer, when they say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so the question tonight is, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean to believe? Well, in the original Greek, where the New Testament was written, this is a, a translation from the Greek word pistu, and pistu simply means having your trust and your confidence in a person or something. Having your trust, your confidence in somebody, and in this particular case, Jesus Christ. Well, when we talk of his credentials, when we talk of trusting somebody, we are obviously talking about certain credentials that help us to trust these individuals. Luke 1, for example, 37 says, with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Oh, you know, when, when I look at our Lord Jesus Christ and how the Bible describes him in the book of John, and I want you to turn to John 1, we are talking about the credentials. How can we trust? How can we put our confidence in Christ? Well, please turn with me to the book of John, chapter 1. Notice how John, one of the disciples, puts it there. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him nothing was made that was made. 
in him was life and the life was the light of men. These are the credentials we are talking about. We can trust him. You see, Jesus as deity, as God, has the capacity to move backwards into time. For us as human beings, if we wanted to go back to yesterday, we would have to ask the camera person to roll the tape so that we can see what happened yesterday. But God, our Savior, he has the capacity to move backwards into time. Oh, Jesus has the capacity to move forward into time, from eternity to eternity. So when you talk about Christ, two billion years from now, he is already there. With God, nothing is impossible. Our, our doctor, uh, a few uh, minutes ago, was sharing something with us on cancer. The awareness and how we can prevent cancer. You see, as we all sat to listen, and some of us to watch, the reason why we paid attention is that we understood that she has the necessary credentials. Otherwise, we would have all walked out. What is she doing there? Who does she think she is? But we understand that she took time to train and she has gained the necessary experience for her to walk to this front section of this auditorium and to give this particular presentation. My dear friends, when we talk about Jesus Christ, he has the necessary credentials as God. You need to go to John 11. Because in John 11, there is a story. Somebody by the name of Lazarus has been dead for four days. And as Jesus speaks to his disciples, he tells them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they are thinking, ah, it's the kind of sleep we are used to. He has to explain to them that actually Lazarus is dead. I want you to picture in your mind's eye as Jesus and his disciples get to Bethany and there by the tomb and people have gathered. Nobody knows exactly what is going to happen. And then from nowhere he shouts, Oh, Lazarus, come Fourth, and suddenly there is noise and Lazarus who had been dead for four days wakes up from that slumber of death. My dear friends, with God, with Christ, nothing is impossible. And this is the reason why when we pray, we have this confidence that when we bring all our concerns, he has the capacity not just to share but also to do that which we can't do on our own. These are the credentials. And so, to believe, to place our trust. You know, again, I was flying from, from, from Lusaka to Nairobi, and I didn't know who the, the captain of that particular uh, flight was. I, I believe by faith that, you know, even though I didn't know this man, whether he had taken some alcohol, I had to trust, you know, that somehow he would be able to take us to Nairobi. Even though the plane itself, I didn't know its mechanical state. I had no idea. As a matter of fact, our flight was delayed in Lusaka, we were told there are some operations challenges. And so this flight has been delayed. And I'm thinking, what are those operations? What could they be? Maybe there is something wrong, mechanically speaking, to the flight, to the plane. But when it came, I jumped in there. I trusted the pilot whom I did not know. I trusted the plane I perhaps had never flown in before. 
Oh, my dear friends, when it comes to Jesus, how can I not trust the one who hang on the cross? In the words of Ellen White, even if George Mwansa had been the only human being on planet Earth, Jesus would have come to die for me. That's how he loves us. I can put my confidence, I can put my trust in him. What does it mean to be saved? Well, again, in the original Greek language, the word that is used there is sozo. And sozo, among many things, can mean to be delivered, to be preserved. In the Old Testament, ah, the concept is, you know, God's capacity to move into Egypt and to deliver his people out of their bondage and to take them into the promised land to preserve them in the promised land in the New Testament. It changes slightly because their deliverance is from the power of sin. When we are delivered from the power of sin, we are preserved into eternal life. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You know, I can't think of texts better than the ones that I must now introduce. In the book of John, chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible there says, To those who received him, to those who believed in his name. Once again, notice that word, to those who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, no blood, but children born of God. Oh, I love the beautiful feeling that this has nothing to do with how we are related at the blood level, but it has everything to do with the new birth. And this is a miracle done by God himself to those who believed him, to those who received him, to those who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Now when we look at Matthew, in the book of Matthew, I'd like to read something there as we make progress in this presentation. Please turn with me to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. And uh, I want you to pay particular attention to how this is beautifully stated. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. But in order to get uh, some, uh, 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 um, to put context to this, we will begin from 18. And it says there, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betro betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now notice our focal text. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In the Hebrew culture, Names were very important. How you named your child was a projection. The positive things that you saw could come out of that child. And oftentimes, there was also the angle of connection with God himself. So a name had to be positive and at the same time also somehow share some aspect of God. In my language, names don't mean anything. 
there were people who were asking, what is the meaning of your name, Chama? I said, I don't know. In Bemba, this language that I speak, names don't mean nothing, as the black Americans would put it. They don't mean anything. There, are, there could be a few names that mean something, but, you know, generally, Mwansa doesn't mean nothing. Chama doesn't mean nothing. They are simply names. But not so in many other African languages, including the Hebrew language. So when Jesus was born, the name Jesus, which basically is a translation, you know, the Hebrew Yeshua, which in English is translated Joshua, and it means Yahweh saves. And indeed, in the, in the words of Christ himself uh, 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 in, in, in Jericho, uh, as uh, he faces opposition by those who felt that it was bad for him to be a guest of Zacchaeus, who was a sinner in in, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10, he says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In the words of Jesus to Nicodemus in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 17, God did not send his Son into the world in order to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We love such a Savior. We love such a savior because when we all go wrong, we've been promised in 1 John 1, 9, when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I love Christ. I love Jesus. But now, I want you to notice something. If we go to the same chapter in Matthew, and we read verse 25. It says, 23, uh, I'm sorry, 23 says, Behold, to give context, let's read 22 first. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, now 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Two big elements about Jesus Christ. Number one, he is Savior. Yahweh saves. Joshua, Yahweh saves. Emmanuel, God with us. Now, this is what creates problems for all of us. Emmanuel, God with us. If we turn our attention to the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 1, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So, number one, you shall have no other gods before me. We are talking about somebody who is Lord. This is the reason why he can command. But notice also something beautiful in this particular Bible text. It says, number one, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You had absolutely no capacity. No matter how hard you tried, those 400 years, you were incapable of redeeming yourselves. It had to take my righteous hand to move in and push you out. Savior. He had no capacity. He moves in as Savior. But once they cross the, the Red Sea, there by the mountain, he changes. He is not just a savior who redeemed them out of Egypt, but now he becomes the Lord. He gives them the commandments. You see, this whole concept of Emmanuel, God 
with us, Lord, over us, is what creates problems for us. In the book of Exodus, chapter 25, verse 8, God there speaking to Moses says, let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And the interesting thing is that for lack of time, you can read this. If you go to Numbers chapter 9 and you begin from 15, there when the sanctuary was made, you know, that movable structure, when it was made, on top was that thing that appeared like a cloud uh, in the night, like a cloud of fire, and in, in, in the daytime, just a cloud. Now, the interesting thing is that every time that particular cloud stood still, it was God's indication to the people that you must camp. When it started moving, it was God's uh, indication to the people, you must begin to move. That is how it was. Emmanuel, God, who was with his people, every uh, so often giving them commands. Here, you need to stop. Here, you need to start moving. Oh, my dear friends, you know, when we talk about believing in Jesus, there are two aspects that are important. Number one aspect is believing in him as Savior. On our own, we do not have the capacity to save, to free ourselves from sin. Number two, and this is the most difficult one, it is now where we say, well, now that you have saved me, you are now... Lord over my life. This is, this is the most difficult thing. Because when he comes in, he doesn't come in as a guest. Where I come from, among the member speaking people, especially in the olden days, when a guest comes, he can be taken to, you know, various rooms like, you know, in the area where you sit, uh, sometimes even the kitchen, especially if, uh, you know, that's a woman. But they can't go to the bedroom. It's a sacred place. They can't go there. You see, when Jesus walks in, he has now become your Lord. He is free to walk to any part of the house, of your, your temple. And Jesus has the freedom he has the right to walk to the kitchen and there in the kitchen to tell you what sort of foods you should be eating. He has the right to go to the living room where you watch television and you listen to music. The right to tell you what sort of music, what sort of things you must be watching. He has the right to move to your bedroom where issues of money are discussed to tell you how your money must be spent. But now... This is the biggest challenge of all of us. So when we say believe in Jesus, I want you to know that the majority of people who come to church have never truly believed according to the way it has been explained. You see, I am happy with Christ being my savior. But I don't want him to be my Lord. My life is my life. If I want to buy stuff, I don't have to consult anybody. No. If you want to buy stuff, there is somebody who now lives in you. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Jesus. It's no longer I that lives. So the main man in the life is no longer George Mansa, but Jesus Christ. You see, the reason why we have issues, marriages falling apart, this is the number one thing. It is simply because we as God's people have never gotten to the point where we have allowed Jesus Christ to be Lord over our lives. So the guy appears in his home and he says, I, I am the head of the household. You are not the head. 
It is actually Christ who is the head. This is my wife. She is only your wife in a sense. Because if God wants, he can take her away. If God wants, you can be gone. And she can be allowed to marry somebody who is going to be better than you. Let's put it this way. Tonight, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, Jesus says, I am standing at the door and I am knocking. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Tonight, dear friends in this auditorium and those of you who are watching out there, the critical question is, have you truly accepted Jesus Christ, not just as your personal savior, but as the Lord of your life? When you accept Christ as Lord over your life, there is so much that is going to change. As a husband, you will be the best husband who can ever be. As a business person, you will be the best. Anything you can think of, when you allow Jesus Christ to have entry to the extent that you now lose yourself, you decrease so that Jesus may increase, you will have the happiest life of your life. So tonight, I would like to appeal to those of you who are here. I want you to think, have you really accepted Christ in the manner the Bible describes it? Or you have simply taken the simpler view of accepting Christ as him just being your savior and not your Lord. How many here in this audience, including those who are watching, are saying, well, maybe this is something we haven't really paid attention to. We would like to pay attention to this matter. It is not as we thought. We would like to truly take Christ, not just as savior, but also as Lord. If you are there, can I see you raise your hand? I know in my own situation, I have fallen many, many times. I have crashed many, many times because I have forgotten that it's not about George Mwansa, but about Jesus Christ being Lord in the life. May he bless you as you leave this auditorium tonight. That your life may change as God intended for it. Let us pray. Our Father who lives in heaven. The greatest question ever asked. What shall I do to be saved? The greatest answer ever given. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But oftentimes we, we have taken a half approach to this whole thing where the important thing for us is to take Christ as our Savior, forgetting that he is Emmanuel, God with us, Lord over our lives. As we go back tonight, oh God, help each one of us to consider this matter seriously because one day we will appear before the great judgment seat of God alone. One day when we walk into the kingdom saved, we will walk there alone, although we will be in a group. So, Father, I now ask that you will bless your children here in this auditorium. 
I pray that you will bless those who took the time to watch. You know the challenges your people face. I pray, oh God, that you may come through for each as each one comes to you through faith in the merits of Christ Jesus who died for us. I thank you for hearing this prayer and for answering it according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen.